My name is Ingrid Hertz. I'm working at the Division of Media Information Technology at Linköping University and I have the pleasure today to tell you a little bit about my research, how we are taking data and try to make the best out of it. So, um, data is one of the most valuable resources that we have nowadays, which has been framed by the Economist 2017 as data is the new oil. And it's certainly true that there are a lot of new opportunities coming up through data. But on the other hand side, data is also one of the biggest challenges that we have to deal uh, with today. So data impacts basically our life everywhere in society and also in research. It starts with healthcare where people are uh, exploiting sensor data, for example, from your phone that you're carrying around and constantly tracking your activities. This is personalized medicine where we try to find the best treatment for a person using data, screening data, imaging data. So this is the case in climate science where we try to predict the future outcomes of the actions that we perform today. Or as a last example, I have um, the development of more sustainable materials, um, which also relies on large uh, scale simulations. So in general, when you are starting to collect data or to generate data, you have some questions in mind and start the process and the result will be a lot of data. But the goal in the end is to get some insights, to find some solutions or to make a decision in the end. And to a certain extent, you can interpret this process as a way of a data reduction, where you start with really an overwhelming amount of data and try to find your answers, which in the end might be only a very small amount of data. But on the way there, there are a lot of uh, steps happening which um, require novel solutions and uh, research. This starts with data handling, like uh, data storage is a big issue nowadays. It's about data quality, integrity, security. And last but not least, it's about data analysis. And there we have a lot of automatic methods uh, using machine learning, but you also can have the human in the loop doing some uh, using visualization to understand the data better. And this is a part of my research, and I will talk a little bit more about that in the following. Sometimes we call this also visual analytics, and this can be defined uh, as a science which helps you to reason about your data by providing support from automatic methods through visual interfaces. Typical questions that we are concerned with is to ask, so how can we use the data in the most efficient way? How can we find something interesting in the data? If you, for example, look at this image here, you see a, it's a simple data set, so your box with flow data, where we just threw in a bunch of glowing particles and their traces are displayed here. Even so, this image basically represents the entire data set. It's not really helpful at this point. Here's a question. How can we find the interesting? In this case, this would be the swirling motion uh, in this data set. And in the bottom image that you see here now, um, this has been automatically extracted using topological method. And now we only show these particle traces that are really relevant to convey this information. Tracking changes is very important in this context, also comparison with large amount of data. All these questions can only be answered in detail uh, in an application context. However, in the background, there are a lot of concepts that are applicable to many different scenarios. So in my own research, I'm mostly uh, confronted with data that comes from some scientific applications. Uh, now I picked a couple of examples to show you how this can look like. So the first example uh, is um, comes from a molecular dynamics um, simulation. Such simulations are interested in different contexts. Here the context is the development of novel trucks. And it's very important to understand the docking process of these little ligands that you see here uh, with a larger uh, molecule. 
Such a data set consists of thousands of time steps, and you can stand here and watch this movie and hope that something interesting happens. However, something much more efficient is to provide an interface that does some analysis for you and supports you in finding the interesting in the data. Here, for example, the chemists are interested in investigating certain angles within their molecules, and they can put in this query to the data set, and automatically uh, the answer is directly uh, extracted from the data set and displayed in these timelines that you see on the bottom here. And this allows you to really jump to places that are of interest uh, to you. So the second example here is an example for material science. It's a design of organic uh, solar cells. These are, um, these are solar cells which are very flexible and um, have a lot of applications. However, they are not yet as efficient as the solar cells that we know otherwise. Organic solar cells com, um, consist of two materials which have a very complex morphology, as you can see uh, in this image here. And an important um, investigation now is how the charges move through uh, this topology. And here people, here these are physicists, are running um, Monte Carlo simulations to get some information about the charge movement uh, in this material. They are here displayed as green and red trajectories. However, again, this picture by itself is not so much helpful. But if you are having a closer look to the material and the morphology, we can basically boil everything down to a charge flow network. And in the end, we can get a very abstract representation of our data which can easily be explored while always keeping the link to our original data and you can always go back to the geometry and see uh, what you are currently exploring. So the next example is an example from a medical application where the goal is to understand the disease where you have symptoms in, in, in your head and you have symptoms in your gut and people would like to know how this what are, the, what are the reasons for this sickness? Where does it come from? And here we have a lot of different data. So we have many patients with, that have been filling out questionnaires, giving some information, for example, about uh, anxiety. There are a lot of measurements, for example, of blood. And there are also screenings of the brain, uh, of, of the function of the brain um, in a resting state. And now the question is, are there any correlations between all these measures? So what you see here on the bottom is something that we call parallel coordinates, where every of these bars represents one different parameter, and every line in these coordinates represents one patient. And now uh, the medical doctor can go there and um, put groups together by filtering out certain properties, combining them together, can put complicated queries to the data set, give, getting an immediately feedback about different correlations to the activities um, in the brain. An interesting fact is that many of these methods that we are originally developed for the scientists, for the exploration of the data, can, you, can be used in a similar way for science communication. So the image that you see on this picture here is taken uh, in the visualization center in North Shopping, and it's displaying an exhibit about the blood flow in the heart. So this application has originally been developed for the scientists to compare the blood flow uh, for example, from a sick person and a healthy person, from a young and old person, or here in this case, also looking at an athletic heart. But in many cases, just with a little bit simplified interfaces, this is also very interesting for the general public to get an understanding of what's happening in research. So now I've been talking about a couple of applications. However, there happens a lot in the background to get these applications going. And in most cases, the first step is to find some thing that we call feature descriptors that provide a descriptive summary of the data targeting your needs. 
And the second step would be kind of to develop some metrics to compare these features, which allow us to track something over time and detect some changes. What you see here in this image is again a simple data set, a flow data set, where now the lines that you see are tracking of vortices um, over time. One of these tracks is highlighted here and again you can get an abstract visualization here which can then be explored in more detail where we show a lot of statistics that had been aggregated along these lines. Similarly you use feature descriptors and metrics to explore large sets of data or some ensemble data. Here in this example, so you see a molecule where people are interested in a charge transfer when you excite this molecule, but not only for one molecule, but for many. And here finding a, a simple descriptor for of this process helps to understand people in one view what is happening here, but can also be used for, from the machine to use, for example, clustering methods to get an overview over your entire data set. So in summary, um, I, say I try to give you a little bit insight into what visual analytics does with a goal kind of to transform numbers, to transform data somehow into insight. So this work is always done in close collaboration with the domain scientists who are generating this data. And it's combining automatic analysis methods with interfaces that support the human in data exploration. Very important requirements for all methods that we are developing here is to be transparent, meaning we want to communicate what we are doing with the data so that the user really knows what's happening here. Methods should be reliable and robust and also be able to uh, work if the data is a little bit corrupted or something is missing. And the results should be interpretable and targeting the scientists' needs. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Ingrid, for that presentation. Very visual, and that's the, well, that's the theme, I believe, here. Yes, exactly. So you got it. <laughs> yes, I got it. I got it. And I think, well, it's always nice to see, well, that kind of presentations. You really get mesmerized, and you, oh, I, re I understand, really. And I'm thinking, uh, this is, we talk about big data. Is this the, it's necessary to have this kind of presentation, otherwise we won't ever be able to, to get the, 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 the core of big data. If we can't visualize it like, like you're... Like yeah, for sure, there are many methods to um, automatically extract also some information of data. But something that I also wanted to mention here, so big data, the question, what is big data? I would say big data can also be not so huge, it's always big, if it's big if your standard methods are not capable to deal with it anymore. So this can have very different uh, ranges. Yeah, yeah. because w when, when you're doing your job, it, it, you don't feel it, oh, not that big. I can understand it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So just tell me, how did you get into this, this area? Well, is it your dream as a girl in, in Germany, I believe? Um, no, this is actually a very, very long story. So my yeah, tell me, tell me, tell me. <laughs> so my background is in physics. Okay. And I did my master's in physics. Where? In, in, where? in Munich, in, in Munich? Germany. Yeah. yeah. And this was very much just pen and paper. And I thought about there are only kind of five to ten people in the world I can talk about my research. Okay. And I was meeting a little bit the communication and interaction with people. And then it rather happened by accident that I ended up in visualization. I saw a poster announcing um, a workshop about visualization. And I just applied there. And immediately after my, I had to give a talk over some papers immediately after that the professor offered me a phd position and i said okay yes i do it okay yeah and um now i think probably i'm even doing more physics sometimes than before so i can approach things on a very high level i have yeah. the opportunity to talk so many to so many different experts mm. which are really doing top-notch research here and there and i'm allowed to ask all the stupid questions yeah yeah well because i also have well, to understand so. yeah i have to also to understand a little bit to develop methods to support them in yeah. the data analysis. do you think it's important to have the the background 
from a re researcher perspective to be able to, to, to do the visualization? It's definitely helpful. Yeah. For sure, it's a long process until you're getting in, in my position and during your PhD, you have the possibility to, to develop knowledge here and there. But it's always important that you show some interest to the data, that you try to understand the needs and that you really communicate with the people who are yeah. needing it. Yes. And then, and then from, uh, from Munich, you, you ended up in, in, in Norrköping. Not immediately. I no, no, well, I realized they were. But, yeah. But, uh, and how come you, you, you came to Norrköping and you have this I think as a, team there? I think as a visualization researcher, you want to be in Norrköping. Yeah. Norrköping is really one of the centers uh, in the world where most uh, is happening. It's a wonderful place. We have a dome theater. We have this museum in addition. And a lot of people dealing with different aspects of visualization in one building. I think this is the perfect place to be as yeah. a visualization. And, and, and the Dome Theater, tell us just about that, because I, I haven't been there, but I, I, I heard about it. What is that? Um, so I don't have the numbers in mind, so this is kind of a half uh, sphere mm. where we have a couple of projectors that are projecting the visualization yeah. in the dome and you get kind of a three-dimensional immersion while and, uh, watching... Will I get car sick in it? Will I... It can that happen. Often, that often happen. Often. It, it, it can happen, but we for sure try to avoid that. <laughs> so if you make no vomiting in the in the dome, please. Yeah, sometimes people get nausea. Okay. Yeah, it, yeah, it can happen. Well, it, I'd like to go there because it sounds uh, well fantastic. But I'm thinking here it, the 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 art of visualization. How good are we when you look around in the in the within the academia or all around? Are, are people well? If you take an overall perspective, how good are we at presenting data? I think, so you mentioned now presenting data. Presenting data is one aspect yeah. and analyzing data is really another aspect. Everybody uses Windows Visualization for presentation. If you go to any talk of any area, you will always have pictures on your slide. And every picture on the slide is some kind, some visualization. Sometimes you are not even aware of that. Some, to some visualizations we are so used mm. that we do not even think about it. But I think this is something very natural that we even have in textbooks at school. Everything is visualized yeah. to explain some concepts, to communicate some things. But also uh, in math, if you remember that there has been the analysis of functions where you look at peaks cell, uh, and, and um, valleys. This is exactly what we are doing with this large data also. Asking exactly the same questions that you probably know from your math class in school. Yeah, and uh, so, so are we, do we need to get better overall to, to be able to, well, get into the future and, 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 and use all the tools? Because it's, it's, uh, it's understanding through, through this. It's understanding and I think visualization is important in almost all areas and it's getting even more important with the increase of uh, the amount of data. But I think it's also very important that the automatic methods and visualization are somehow combined to bring together the, the best of both worlds. But also, a screen only has a certain number of pixels and we are only able to take in so much. So yep. we have to do some simplification for it. We have to do some analysis. We have to focus on aspects um, of interest there. B because we're talking about a very large amount of data sometimes and, and it's complex uh, and we need more research. Uh, further on, is it, it? How do you say this is necessary for getting to, to, to asking the right questions for for next level of research? Uh, is is that the, the 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 key to 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 get to the future? So understanding, okay, this is what the big data, the, the what we are gathering. Uh, so from the understanding, we are enabled to ask the next level of questions. Do you, do you get what I'm? Yeah. Uh, um, so this is actually a, a, a process. Visualization is not a picture. Visualization is not one solution. I always see this as a process in working with people. So we are providing something, they're using it, and hopefully new questions are coming back yeah. and we are developing new methods supporting uh, the questions that are coming Yeah, up. and uh, I believe it, the researchers themselves, they, they don't really, they, they cannot really grasp the, 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 the amount of information. So helping them understanding what the research is, is all about, being able to ask new questions. 
for sure we are dreaming of that. So sometimes you also must be a little bit careful because people know their data quite well. It's not like that I can come in from the outside and solve all their problems. Of course you can. Of course I can, but <laughs> I sh I'm not allowed to say it in that way. No. <laughs> okay, yeah, great. I, I, I just it's, uh, kind of trying to support and this must be in interaction. Yes. Yeah. But when it comes to, I'm, I'm thinking of techniques because we're, we're, we're close to the world of, of, of uh, well, the, the game, sport, gaming industry. We are into. We have these big screens, and and the, we have the uh, all all kinds of games, computer games. And also, we have uh, augmented reality, virtual reality, getting into these. What what are the future when it comes to? Can we use that kind of techniques? That to kind of technique is used all the time. Yeah. I think much of the uh, technique when it comes to graphics, to the representation of the final image, is really developed in the gaming industry. There's some the money and they uh, can do this development. So this is not really our research. We are rather using these methods. Yeah. So most time we are really concerned with data analysis and thinking about what would be a good visual abstraction of something. And then we're using all the computer graphics sets around there. For sure, we also have to know a little bit about this to make things fast and efficient. Um, but this is basically the last step in what we are doing. But, uh, but can, should it be, well, should we welcome uh, more collaborations between the gaming industry and, and this kind of... There is definitely it? some collaboration. Because so the there are interactions um, in any case, so yeah. Yeah, and, and, uh, and are the gaming industry Aware of that? Are they going into this kind of uh, well visualization of, of research? I think they are probably not too much interested in what we are doing. So they have a, a fundamental difference is that we are trying to take real data and make pictures out of it, and they create their own world. Yeah. So they have all the freedoms. They don't have to be true to some data. If they show a waterfall, it doesn't matter whether this is really happens like that. It has to look somehow plausible, so, but they don't care about... Yeah, but I mean, if you mix it, you have, okay, we have to, well, keep, well, uh, the, 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 the facts right, we cannot change even if we want, but just enable new, new interpretations, uh, looking from different angles, have, having fun with it. Okay, we can do the, okay, I see. Yeah, That's a kind of... of this uh, happens, okay. certainly, yeah. So, so you need to bring well the, all the techniques from from the gaming world into and first shoot a game with it. I itself. would say, especially the PhD students who are working in uh, visualization, they are often also gamers, yeah. and this automatically establishes kind of some link between these two worlds. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's very fascinating to see. Uh, uh, what about uh, um, where do you start if you have if I come with the, uh, well, I have tons, oh, large amount of data. Ingrid, help me, help me, take this. I have a, a, about pedestrians in, in Burkina Faso. Uh, I just have data, what, help me, what would you do? The first thing uh, so uh, that I would visit people and look what they are currently doing with their data to get an understanding what is a typical workflow. Yeah, we what have this collaboration with Burkina Faso about pedestrians and uh, so, I, I, so uh, probably I cannot go to Burkina Faso, but uh, I would visit the researcher and this yeah. researcher would explain me why am I doing this. These are questions, etc. What are your questions? What do you try to learn from your data? And you talk with, with the researcher now. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I would talk with a researcher as a person who collects this data. Yeah. Because everybody who collects data has in the back of the mind some motivation. Yeah. And I think we are trying to figure out what uh, is this are motivation. The, are they good? Uh, could it come with a situation where the researcher don't really know what... Uh, we don't really know actually what we are... We have a feeling, but we're not really... So it's sure. always the case. I think, and this is a, part, a fun part of our job, yeah. trying to nail people down to something more specific. Okay. And often so yeah, just people come with vague questions and yeah. we have to translate this somehow <laughs> into the formal. Yeah. And then asking back, do you mean this? Yeah. Oh, now, now she comes again, Ingrid from Germany, with all her questions. People might, for example, say, with the pedestrians, I, I look at the data somehow, I see some patterns, can't you extract these patterns? And then you try to figure out, 
what do you mean? Okay. These patterns. Yeah, I see this zigzag here, and there's a, a line going there, and then you try and to. They have a gut feeling. Okay. Have a gut feeling, and yeah. then you try to nail it down more and more and more, yeah. and then we look back in our toolbox, kind yeah. of our experiences that we have, and yeah. consider, oh, this might be something that could fit here, and then there are kind of first steps that we are trying to do some stuff with the data, and then. And then, and then you show them, this is, show this them. is uh, where we are at the moment. No, 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 that's not what I'm looking at. Yeah, but there you also must be careful because people often do not even know what's possible. So and in the beginning, people are often very reluctant yeah. if they are seeing something new. And then you are kind of the one who have to sell also your method. Mm -hmm. You have to give people time to get into it because it provides completely new perspective onto something they have probably working with for many, many years and all of a sudden somebody from the outside comes and says, yeah, yeah. did you look from this angle or might this be interesting? And uh, this is also the point where for me uh, collaboration either becomes interesting, yeah. where I see there is also some interest because there must happen something from both sides or people are completely not willing to do, okay. accept something new. And then this collaboration is not so interesting for me from a research perspective, because we are also longing for, for novel questions. We, are, we want to go a step further, not use the methods that have been used in, yeah. for a long time and that are well established. Does it happen that you come into, you run into a conflict and you know we won't solve this, we have an idea, but the researcher won't buy it? it you, I, I feel it pretty early. So when I build up my collaborations, it's a topic that should be interesting, but it should be an open-minded person also. Yeah. And you feel it very soon. Okay. Yeah. Fascinating. And if you, since we are, we are well, looking into the future uh, and we all have to well, come along, what will you see in, in well, 10, 20 years? ahead, uh, what will happen in this area, uh, what is, will be the future, um, can you have any, any thoughts, where are we sure. going? So I think the um, methods coming from machine learning and the methods coming from an analysis with a human in the loop, they will be much more integrated, hopefully. You always have to think about where do I need the human at all, everything that can be automized, which is just a burden for us in the analysis. So that's great if the machine comes into place and can support what we are doing. On the other hand side, I think visualization can also support a lot the understanding of what the machine is doing to make a little bit more transparent, kind of opening this black box and saying, this is what's happening here. This is what's asking the questions also why. But I think um, bringing these areas together in an efficient way and realizing this is not a competition, but this is kind of complementary. I think this is what where we are heading to. Yeah. And, and, and I'm, I'm, I'm thinking of the, the entertainment industry. We have this sense around, uh, well, all the, the senses, smells and, and sounds and, and, and different. Do, do we will have, now we talk yes, about visualization? Uh, uh, definitely. And visualization is sometimes even meant in a broader sense so that sonification will be a part of it. We, as a, we ourselves, we have a project where we use a haptic pen to follow the blood flow in the heart. So where the pen is kind of attracted to the flow, so it gets, you have the visuals, but at the same time you can kind of feel the resistance of something. Okay. And this uh, interplay between these different senses makes the experience of much more, much stronger. Yeah. Well, this is very fascinating. Well, thank you for coming here and telling us all about these uh, uh, astonishing things. Uh, good luck in the future. And, uh, thank you very much. Send uh, our regards to your team in Norshoping. Definitely, I will do this. Thank you. Thank you all uh, for participating uh, and uh, I hope you enjoyed.